Well, here we are with day 19 of our 31 Days with Jesus uh, series of video messages. So being the 19th of October, we have, of course, day 19. And the themes which I've been given are taken from another Bible, day by day readings. Um, and we're going through and we're up to day 19 now. So the theme we're given for today is Jesus sends out his disciples. Jesus sends out his disciples. And the reading we're given is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verse 1 through to verse 24. So Luke, chapter 10, verse 1 to verse 24. <clears throat> now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them two by two, ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. And he was saying to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the labourers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers into his harvest. Maybe that has always been a bit of a problem. That's why Jesus said, Beseech or pray earnestly to the Lord to send out labourers into his harvest. Now, let's understand this, because it talks about his, with a capital H, his harvest. Talking about God's harvest. It's not our harvest. We don't harvest people for ourselves. We are simply the harvesters. And the people who come into the kingdom, they come into the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of any one particular person. So it's not about us. We are not drawing people to ourselves. Beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers into his harvest. And there was a need to pray earnestly for people to perform the works and the acts and, and the duty of evangelism. Now, some people would say, well, I'm not an evangelist, am I? Well, I would say to them, no, maybe you don't consider yourself to be an evangelist, but... You are a witness and you are able to go out into the harvest field and be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. You are able to do that. You don't have to call yourself an evangelist. This role is, it's not really a role, it's a job title. Although there are maybe some who have the gift of evangelism, the spiritual gift of evangelism. Maybe that's a role, that is a role which they are expected to fulfil. But not everybody has that gift, and I would suggest most people don't have that gift. But most people who are Christians, in fact everybody who is a Christian, who doesn't have the gift of evangelism, is called on to be a witness, and to actually get engaged, to go out and do the work which the Lord Jesus wants us to do. Go your ways. Behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Maybe that's why people don't relish the idea of going out to witness, because they are going out as lambs in the midst of wolves. And we know who will get the better there. In the natural, a wolf will always win against a lamb. The wolf will kill the lamb and eat it. There is no contest. There's no question. But of course, that's not the case here, spiritually. We don't go out as Christians... As, as a defeated body of people. We go out as Christians, as a body of people, victorious in the victory of the Lord Jesus. He is our great shepherd. He looks after his lambs. And we go out as lambs being looked after by the shepherd, the good shepherd, the Lord Jesus. We, yes, we go out as lambs and there are wolves around, but he will protect us. Have a read of Psalm 23, of course, now, if you wish, or maybe wait till the end of this message and have a read of Psalm 23 to see how encouraging and reassuring the protective elements in Psalm 23 are. Carry no purse, no bag, no shoes, and greet no one on the way. And whatever home, sorry, whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if a man of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And stay in that house, 
eating and drinking what they give you, for the labourer is worthy of his wages. Do not keep moving from house to house. Some people might say that means do not go door to door. Well, maybe that's true. I don't know. It does say there, on the one hand, go into a house, pray peace upon the house. And if there's a man of peace there, the peace will rest. If, it, if, if there isn't a man of peace there, it will come back to you. But go into a house and, and have something to eat, which you're offered, have something to drink, which you're offered. And then it says, do not keep on moving from house to house. The way I read this, or a way to read this, perhaps is a better way for me to put it. A way to read this is to say that rather than going door to door, knocking on doors, one meets, a Christian would meet somebody in the street, in the marketplace, in the shop, um, on the sports field. And the invitation is issued to go to the house. And as one goes to the house by invitation, one says, the Christian says, peace be to this house. That is a way to look at this. And that would explain the sentence there at the end of verse 7, which says, do not keep moving from house to house. But it's not a prohibition on going into a house. And whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat what is set before you and heal those in it who are sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. That is phrased in such a way, the healing, verse 9, and heal those who, those in it who are sick. There's no option there. It doesn't say if you consider somebody needs healing, heal them, or if you feel like somebody needs healing, heal them. It simply says, whenever, whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat what is set before you and heal those in it who are sick. It's a commandment, one might say. Look at it that way. We must be prepared to offer healing to people. And then and saying to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. This reminds me of when we had a look at, on two messages of John Baptizer saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Of course, those references to Matthew, where Matthew in his gospel refers to the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't refer to the kingdom of God. But other gospel writers refer to the kingdom of God. Synonymous expressions. So when we as Christians come and we interact with people, we talk to people about the Lord Jesus, we offer healing to people in the name of Jesus. And of course it's Jesus who heals, not us. The kingdom of God has come near we're not special, but the kingdom of God is. So we offer the kingdom of God to people. And a, a, um, a healing, somebody who is healed, is a sign. It's not the be all and the end all, although, of course, it's very important for that person. It might be critically important for that person to be healed. But the ne plus ultra, one might say, the end game is salvation, is entry into the kingdom of of God or the kingdom of heaven and a person doesn't enter the kingdom of God by the healing if somebody is healed by God of a disease or an illness or some allergy or deformity if they're healed that doesn't mean they automatically become a Christian but the kingdom of God is very 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 close and it's a it's a step it's a big step for them to come into the kingdom it's a sign healing is a sign as we looked at when we looked at a passage or two in John uh, where John talks of signs attesting miracles and we looked at what a sign is in that particular video message verse 10 but whatever city you enter and they do not receive you go out into its streets and say even the dust of your city which clings to your feet we wipe off in protest against you. Yet be sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come near. It's a warning there, it's a declaration that where people reject, where, where there is a city, people in a city, where they say, no, not interested, get
go away. Well, we can say, the city of God has come near. We can't say, well, you have had your chance and there will never be another chance. No, we're not, not permitted to say that. We are permitted to say, well, this is an opportunity for you and you possibly may not get another opportunity. We can, we, we can say the kingdom of God has come near, but you have put your foot against the door. You have said, no, you're rejecting the kingdom of God. Hence, you're rejecting the king, who is the king of the kingdom of God. You are rejecting God. I say to you, it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Woe to you, Chorazim. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Of course, Tyre and Sidon being in Gentile country, up on the north-east side of what we today would call Israel. I believe Tyre and Sidon are in Israel, modern-day Israel. I'm not sure about that. Let's say they're on the Mediterranean coast anyway. That, that I can say with certainty. But if the miracles which had taken place in Chorazim and Bethsaida had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, the people in Tyre and Sidon would have repented and sat in sackcloth and ashes. The miracles would have had their desired effect. But Chorazim and Bethsaida, no. But it would be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will be brought down to Hades. The one who listens to you listens to me. This is, and this is Jesus talking to the disciples again. The one who listens to you, the disciples, listens to me, Jesus. And the one who rejects you, the disciples, rejects me. And he who rejects me, that's Jesus, rejects the one who sent me. That's the Father. So there's a, a sequential series of events there, really, although they are contemporaneous. If that's not a contradiction, to have a sequential contemporaneous act. People reject the Christian who shares the gospel, but in rejecting the Christian who shares the gospel, people are rejecting Christ. And in rejecting Christ, they are rejecting God the Father. Now, verse 17, this, the scene shifts a little bit. Because what we now see is the disciples having gone out, they return to Jesus. And in Luke 10, verse 17, it says, And the seventy, that's the seventy disciples, returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Well, there's a declaration and a statement of authority if ever there was one. The Lord Jesus saw Satan falling from grace. We might put it like that. Falling from his position in heaven as being an exalted angel, an important angel in heaven, falling like lightning. As quick as that, as quick as a flash. Falling from heaven like lightning. This is why Jesus is superior to Satan. He always was, he always has been. Jesus, who is... Who, 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 is, who is not created, a non-created being in spirit, as opposed to Satan, who was created, and who, who then, because of his own actions, fell from grace. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on, upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall injure you. Nevertheless... So the Lord Jesus is say, talking about their position here and, and their protection. But now he says, nevertheless, don't, don't, don't think too much of yourself. No, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. But rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. So there's no room for pride here. Uh, yet the spirits are subject to the Christian in the name of Jesus 
because the disciples said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Demons are not subject to me, Charlie. They're not subject to you, whoever you are. The demons are subject to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that they're cast out. We, uh, we, we've touched upon this um, once or maybe twice in a couple of one or two teachings recent, recently. The demons are subject to the authority and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's in his name that the demons will leave somebody. A person can be dispossessed of demonic entities. But the Lord Jesus is saying, well, hang on a minute. Whoa, hang on. Don't rejoice because the demons are subject to you when you go out and you cast them out in, in my name. But rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. The joy, the ultimate joy, is that we Christians are going to our destination, which is heaven. At that very time, he, that's capital H, that's Jesus, at that very time he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit and said, well, I think this is wonderful. The idea of Jesus rejoicing. It, it, yes, he was God, but yes, he was man. So he was rejoicing here greatly in the Holy Spirit. I can't quite picture what he would have been doing, how he would have been rejoicing. But we're told what he said, which I'll come on to now. At that very time, he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit and said, I praise thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you did hide these things from the wise and intelligent and did reveal them to babes. Yes, Father, for thus it was well pleasing in thy sight. Confirmation there of what I was talking about in yesterday's video message about Jesus turns things up and upside down and Yes, he did talk to the elite, who would have been people with intelligence, but he talked to everybody else. And, and Jesus rebuked the elite. And his heart was for those people, the heart of Jesus was for those people who would attend to his words and be prepared to give their lives as Jesus would be giving his life very shortly after he spoke to them. So he's saying here, he's rejoicing because... The wise and the intelligent, they didn't get it, but those people who were, as it were, babes, not literally babies, but who were prepared to come to Jesus as little children, which we looked at in yesterday's message, people who were prepared to be very simple and straightforward not trying to intellectualise faith, not trying to intellectualise the gospel, but just coming in faith, accepting what it says and responding accordingly in a simple way with a childlike faith. Jesus was rejoicing over that particular state of affairs. Verse 22, all things have been handed over to me by my father and no one knows who the son is except the father and who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. And turning to his disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. For I say to you that many prophets and kings wished to see the things which you see, and did not see them, and to hear the things which you hear, and did not hear them. You see, in the past, as I've said in a previous message, the prophets in the Hebrew scriptures, brackets, the Old Testament, close brackets, the prophets spoke of the Messiah. And there was a looking forward. There was a yearning and a, a, a desire to see the Messiah, to have the Messiah come to earth, to be the rescuer, the deliverer, to be the saviour. That was who the Messiah was going to be. And the prophets spoke of this and, and they longed to see the Messiah and to hear the things 
which the Messiah would say. Now the disciples were in a better position, therefore, than the prophets of old. And we, as Christians, born again, having God in us, the Spirit of God living in us, in that sense we are in a better position as well than, than the prophets. Because the prophets wished to see the things which the disciples had seen, and to hear the things which the disciples had heard. Now all these have been written down for us in Scripture. The Old Testament, as it's commonly called, or the Hebrew Scriptures, which I prefer to call them, looked forward, and the later Scriptures, the New Testament, are a fulfilment of what was written in what was written beforehand. So we as Christians, born again, we are in a wonderful, great position. And maybe we should take the lead there from the Lord Jesus, where it says in verse 21 that he rejoiced greatly in the spirit. And it gives the reason why and what he said. Yeah. Hey, as Christians, let us rejoice in the spirit. Let us sing out our songs in our own language or in a heavenly language, in a spiritual language, however one wants to. Let us sing out our praises or speak out our praises. But whatever we do, let us, let us come and rejoice greatly in the Holy Spirit because we are in such a great position, a favoured position, a privileged position as Christians. We have many advantages over the prophets of old. So that's uh, day 19. Jesus sends out his disciples. Please join me if you can tomorrow, the 20th of October, for day 20.